just to deal with the years that Anna dealt with already. So some of this you were going to have heard already. But, uh, but I'll say it better. <laughs> um, my my uh, assignment was the Westminster years, which um, is very interesting for me to go back, because it forced me to go back into my memory, uh, which sometimes isn't so hot. I'm going to start with Mansfield and go on through leaving Westminster. So, I thought many of you might, this is Mansfield right here, would you go back on I thought many of you might not know what Westminster was all about, so there are a few slides uh, about Westminster. It's, um, the place is very important to uh, George, and so I thought you should see what it looked like. Anyhow, in the fall of 1933, George Lynn made the decision to study music at Mansfield State Teachers College and Mansfield PA. This, I think, is a slide uh, that we can show you. I think was taken long before your mother and George were there. <laughs> but, but it was what I could find, and everything else was too modern. So. And it reminded me of this building, actually, I must say. While we were totally involved, while he was totally involved in the music department there and had no intention of ever leaving or making any changes, an event happened that was to change his personal course and ultimately that of Westminster Choir College forever. He tells it, Freddie Huntington was from Princeton's Westminster Choir School, visited the campus at Mansfield State Teachers College to see his girlfriend. I heard him sing it a little and I thought, I like that. By the time, that time, in 1935, he had been studying voice at Mansfield for two years. Lynn quickly came to the decision, as he often did, that he would go to Princeton and hear the choir in which Huntington sang Westminster. When he made the trip, Westminster Choir had just returned from their European tour. When I heard Freddie Huntington's voice, I heard a full-blown sound that none of the tenors at Mansfield campus had, and I thought, gee, that's amazing. To Lynn, music had always been about sound, pitch being secondary, and let me explain that in his words. He reasoned that pitch was to music as legs are to track stars. You simply can't do it without them. So off to Princeton, Lynn and a couple of his friends went to hear Westminster Choir sing in Alexander Hall and Princeton campus. I couldn't get over the sound. So I went back to Mansfield and said, I can't come back to the school here next year. It just didn't have the glamour, the glamour I heard at the choir school. So in the fall of 1935, George Lynn entered Westminster Choir School as a scholarship student where he found faculty that challenged him at every turn. In my personal talks with George Lynn, as well as in uh, John Bueller's wonderful biography, Lynn mentions time and again how greatly he was impacted by the many teachers at Westminster. Of the 21 education educators he mentioned to Bueller in his book, who most influenced him, 13 were encountered at the choir school. These were instructors who not only had knowledge to impart, but ones who insisted on perfection. He told me that many times about Carl Weinberg, for instance, how he had everything absolutely perfect. And they also had another element they needed, a, a, a magic of inspiration. So he mentions these people as very, very important to him. Carl Weinrich, who was his organ teacher, Paul Beppley, his conducting teacher, one of them. John Baumgartner, his voice teacher. Roy Harris, conducting, er, composition. And of course, John Philman Williamson, the founder of the school. These men shaped and molded him in preparation for his three pre-appearances at the, as music his third appearance as music director at Westminster Choir School. Lynn was to accept totally their discipline and strove to adhere to it as closely as possible. Perhaps he didn't rebel at perfection as he'd grown up in a household 
where many of the same values were imposed by his father. In the years that George Lynn was at Westminster as a student, 1935 to 1938, it is important to note that it had not yet been designated a college. It, in many respects, he always felt the choir school had abandoned some of their original values to take on the title of Westminster Choir College. The good ones, he says, could leave with a practical knowledge, could walk into a town, audition anybody, put them in a chorus, find pieces that were within their aesthetic capability, and make a fine sound. It was a school for carpenters, not, not architects. Very common people out of which we could find uncommon qualities, that seems to be a, a, a line through his whole life. That was the greatness of the school. Now we think, and I love this line, now we think that sophistication is greatness. It's not, it's froth. <laughs> During Lynn's years as a student, the campus at Princeton was very new. The original quadrangles the only, uh, build, were the only buildings there. The buildings had been given by uh, Cle Cleveland, and I, if I get this word right, I know God's in heaven, philanthropist. <laughs> <laughs> Any idea how many times I've said that word out loud? <laughs> Anyhow, Sophia Strong, Taylor, uh, and she gave the entire four main buildings of the campus. Shirley Morgan, who was at Princeton University in the School of Architecture, designed the buildings. Appearances with orchestras seemed to be rare in this period of breaking in, but Williamson's quest for sound was unremitting. He could be quite obstinate and did not tolerate any opposition to his way of doing things. Nonetheless, Lynn, always viewed Dr. Williams as the figure most influential in his personal and music, mus musical development. Williamson drew people to him, touched by his magnetic personality and dynamic leadership. Lynn says, I remember writing papers against him in his conducting class. And in my senior year, I accused him of being an autocrat. I could not be <laughs> I didn't go to the last couple months of classes. This is, this is something George we're talking about here, folks. Uh, he still gave me three A's because he knew I was an honest-to-God maverick. <laughs> it seems to me that when he returned to Westminster as the director of music and all that that meant, Lynn sought out and extended a friendly hand to all the mavericks he encountered, faculty and students. It was the only reasonable explanation why, I, why he would not only become my mentor of things choral, but a dear friend as well. Time was an agent of distillation. As George Lynn moved into his professional life, he understood just how great John Kendall Williamson was. <clears throat> I had to get out of the world before I realized, I, out into the world, before I realized how valuable, valuable he'd been to me. And then whenever he'd call, he'd say, I have a favor to ask. And I'd say, shoot, what is it? And then he'd say, oh, don't you want me to tell you what it is? And I'd say, I owe you too much. I can't let you do that. He would do whatever Williamson asked without exception including the eventual move to Princeton to become the Westminster's director of music. After the war, he took advantage of the GI Bill and uh, went to New Jersey to study composition with Randall Thompson at Princeton University. He taught and conducted <clears throat> at Colorado Co College in the summer of 1947, and after receiving his match, uh, Master's of Fine Arts from uh, Princeton, he. Uh, returned to Westminster in that fall <clears throat> as a member of the voice capital conductor of the 70 Voice Chapel Choir and head of the conducting department. He collaborated with Joseph Kerman, a fellow graduate student at Princeton, to present what is believed to be the first All Shoots concert in the United States on May 5, 1948, with George Lynn conducting the Chapel Choir. This period of Lynn's life and work at Westminster is not well documented in the archives of the school, 
But I do think his being there for that time made him acutely aware of some things that the choir college maybe needed. When I was a conductor of the chamber choir of Grand Rapids, Dr. Lynn repeatedly asked me to consider performing some of the Shoots Christmas story. I must say I wasn't terribly enthusiastic to do it. I finally, after hearing it for about five years, agreed. And I said, I'll do it, teach it, you come and conduct it. Here's where I made my mistake. They were, they were well prepared, but I decided I'd have it done with authentic in instruments. <laughs> if I, where is, is he here? Yeah. I so enjoyed your comment about performance practices and music. <laughs> um, so I hired the local group of Sackbutt's reporters to sort of thing to come play it. And at the rehearsal, I, I well, never mind. Uh, they were not bad players, I'm, I'm not saying that. Anyhow, George, you know it can be very understated, and yet you've got the point driven through you like a railroad spike. So we're in the car, he's just finished the rehearsal. He turned to me, I can still see his face, he turned to me just while I was driving, he was in the passenger seat, he says, you know Larry, there's a reason we don't drive model keys. <laughs> There's nothing else we could do at that point, but I, I thought, point well taken. Williamson well, retired from Westminster Choir College in 1957 at the age of 70. Fear of enrollment dropping and that, that announcement was realized. Others stepped in as president with various successes and as the music director with less success than Williamson wanted. I think Williamson feel that, felt that the choir college was losing its original focus, that is to say, uh, tone, and it was leaning far too close to what was called sophisticated by Dr. Lynn. In 1962, it was evident to Williamson that somebody from the old school, school needed to take the reins. Dr. Lee Hastings Bristol assumed the position of president and George Lynn was called in to become the music director. He, Williamson, called me every week for one year during 1962. Williamson cautioned me that when I went back in 1963, do not do anything to interfere with the Westminster Choir College students singing in New York and Philadelphia, that is with the two orchestras. That's where their big learning experience is. He knew that. He was a tone man. So George Lind arrived at Westminster as the, the director of music at a very difficult time, to be sure. He, his determination and his vision equaled those of the mentor, his mentor in many ways. He also realized what was missing in the Westminster Choir College were elements of the old Westminster Choir School. To that end, there were additions to the faculty. Paul Beckley returned to teach his delightful brand of conducting. I was in that class and never wanted to miss a moment as every class was a venture in musical subjects that weren't always in conducting books. Julius Herford continued to teach music history, but George gave him an assistant, Ann Waters, to help the students understand and interpret what, in fact, Julius Herford wanted from them. <laughs> it was sometimes very hard to tell. Herford was also giving the top 10 or so students uh, to study the music of Bach. These uh, seniors enjoyed the exact same class he taught his doctoral students at the University of Indiana. Dr. Lynn didn't forget Dr. Williamson's words about orchestral performances either. The following is a list, uh, is a list of performances as distilled through Diane, my wife, and I's memories, and several different versions, because none, none of them agree. So, this is what I think is the authentic list. <laughs> I'm pretty sure of that too, Anna. <laughs> so, um, the first thing we did was the Janicek Slavonic Mass with the New York Philharmonic, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. Now, this was prepared by Elaine Brown because she had already been on faculty and he did not, I think it was the second semester of his uh, being director of music that he took over actually working with 
the symphonic choir. Uh, anyhow, uh, the work was one of the first programs to do use the new Aeolian Skinner, and since it's been gone for a century and isn't in a church in, in uh, California, I thought maybe you'd like to see what it looks look like. It was a thrill to stand in front of that mm -hmm. instrument and sing, particularly when the organist played low C of the 32-foot bombard <laughs> because it was right behind the tenor's head. So. <laughs> 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 this, this performance was also recorded, and I believe you can still buy it on the CD format. It was fantastic. Uh, and if you know the Anacek Master, I want to talk about. We also did Symphony No. 3, the Kaddish with uh, Leonard Bernstein, his own Kaddish Symphony, with the New York Philharmonic. We did the Mass in C minor, conducted first by Lynn at the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, for the Musical Fund Society of Philadelphia. And then we repeated the Mass in C minor with Nicholas Harshani and the Princeton Symphony. And as I recall, that performance took place in the part of theater on the Princeton campus because it seated more people than it did Alexander Hall. The following year, this would be the first full year that he had the symphonic choir, Dr. Lin uh, <coughs> prepared the following performances. Bach and Tyler, 79, 51, and 147, with Russell Weil and the Philadelphia Chamber Orchestra, the Barry Requiem with the Eugene Ormley and the Philadelphia Orchestra, which was recorded by Sony and still receives rave reviews. Beethoven Symphony No. 9 with Leonard Bernstein and the National Symphony Constitution Hall. And I have to stop and tell you a story about that. We were in D.C. for three days. We were to have three days of rehearsals with this National Philharmonic. And uh, we got there, and we rehearsed. And imagine this, Dr. Lynn is standing out. I can still see his face. Uh, Bernstein heard about four chords from the choir, that first Freud, I'm sure. And uh, he turned to Dr. Lynn and he said, I think I'm going to dismiss the choir until the final rehearsal. They're far better than the orchestra. Oh. Now, that was 250 college students, free on the st streets of D.C. Just imagine what you want, and you will be right. <laughs> or Carmina Burana with Victor Teva was done that year with the Chilean National Ballet and the State Theater uh, of the uh, New York Performing Arts Center there. That was just Westminster Choir, because he only needed 40 people. We also did the Mozart Requiem with Herman Scherch and the Avery Fisher Hall in recognition of the first anniversary of President Kennedy's death. The Symphonic Choir also sang Jock Velasco's Cantata with the Columbus Boy Choir and Marian Anderson with Velasco conducting members of the New York Orchestra, NBC Orchestra for a special on NBC about the opening of the New York, New York World's Fair. And see that bald guy up there in the corner? That's, that is me. <laughs> to be English right, that is I. Anyhow, it was recorded in a ballroom in Brooklyn and uh, we lip synced the, the sync the music, and I remember it was a freezing cold day in April, early April, at the site of the fair, and we'd go from venue to venue, and it was filmed by NBC. It showcased 200 Westminster singers, 75 from the Columbus Boy Choir choristers, and so when it was shown on NBC in April 22, it wasn't a bad day for Princeton choirs. The Orf Carmina Burana, the Westminster Choir, was required for it. We were required to memorize the entire score as we were being staged with the ballet and housed in various monk huts toward the rear of the stage. <laughs> Not kidding about this. I remember the first dress rehearsal. Here we were in sackcloth, literally robes made of burlap. <laughs> clustered into these various huts, not necessarily with our own part, at the rear of the stage, so far removed from the lip of the stage that we could just barely see Teva uh, in the orchestral pit. Supposedly, 
we were to sing this complicated score from memory in hot, scratchy burlap, the scantily cat and clad dancers leaping here and there before our faces, further obscuring the already hard-to-see conductor. Sound like a recipe for disaster? <laughs> it was. <laughs> we saw Dr. Lynn get answer and answer. You know, I, I, I could just tell it was going to happen. And uh, pretty soon he stood up, came down and tapped Tava on the shoulder, and they had this conversation, and Tava called her orchestral break. When it was over, we were positioned in half the orchestra pit with the ballet orchestra squeezed into the other half. We retained the burlap garb, sang the work from our new and greatly improved sight lines while the dancers leapt and twirled in on the bridal splendor in front of a hired extra who filled those monk huts. Dr. Lynn was ever aware of his choirs and their needs. In 1965, which was my senior year, uh, we did Beethoven Ninth with Herbert von Karajan and the Berlin Philharmonic, Mahler Symphony No. 4 with Stokowski and the American Symphony, the Verity Requiem with Eugene Ormandy and the New York Philadelphia Orchestra, and it was performed this time in Edgar Fisher Hall in New York City. I remember that Ormandy kept us seated for the Curie. The New York Times reviewer said of the performance that when the choir rose to sing the Dies Irae in their brilliant red robes. It was as if the flames of hell themselves were leaping off the stage. <laughs> we also did Mendelssohn's Elijah uh, with Lynn conducting at the First Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia with Dr. McCurdy at the organ console in honor of Dr. Kurt McCurdy's retirement from Westminster. While that's not an orchestral performance, it was an education of other sorts as McCurdy, in fact, was a one-man orchestra. In 1966, they did the Bach B minor mass with Lynn conducting the New York Chamber Orchestra. Handel's Messiah with Sir Malcolm Sargent and the New York Philharmonic. Beethoven, Mises Solemnus, William Stein, Steinberg and the New York Philharmonic. Mahler's Symphony No. 8 with Leonard Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic. And Frank Lewin's Music for the White House with the Marine Band. Now, you've got to realize that none of these performances were a performance. There were six to eight performances of all of these works, always, um, to satisfy the, the New York and Philadelphia audiences. Um, immediately following the eighth performance of the Mahler Eighth, Westminster choir members were put on the buses and whisked to Washington to sing music for the White House. This piece was commissioned and performed at the request of Lady Bird Johnson. In 1967, Lynn's own Gettysburg Address with Leopold Tchaikovsky and the American Symphony, the Galbrielli in uh, Ecclesiastes with Leopold Tchaikovsky and the American Symphony in Carnegie Hall, uh, Beethoven's Symphony 9 with Tchaikovsky and the American Symphony, Hyde and the Creation with Alfred Baumstein, the New York Philharmonic for the American Bible Society, Berlioz, The Damnation of Faust, with William Steinberg in the New York Philharmonic. Brahms, a German Requiem, with Lynn conducting for the Musical Fund Society of Philadelphia. 1968 is a very unusual year. I still think it's wrong in the archives, but I can't prove it. There was only one performance, The Bliss of Beatitudes, with Sir Arthur Bliss. And everybody that I've talked to at the choir college says they just can't be right, but we can't. And the girls, if you find any more, let me know. Um, anyhow, for those of you that don't know the choral setup at Westminster, how many are you in time? In the years at Westminster, uh, where when Lynn and Williamson were there, there was a chap choir made up of the freshman class. The symphonic choir was made up of all the re remaining students, grad and undergrad. And Westminster choir, which were four, uh, 40 members from the audition uh, from the symphonic choir, and two alternatives uh, per section. That was added in Lynn's years. Uh, preparations for all the works were made on daily rehearsals of one hour on Monday through Friday at 10 o'clock. Weekends were rarely dedicated to rehearsals as most of the students served in area churches in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, 
and were unavailable for rehearsals. In fact, many were gone for the whole weekend. The select Westminster Choir of 40 voices had additional rehearsals on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5.30, as well as returning two weeks early in the fall for preparatory rehearsals for the tour programs. Certainly in his years at Westminster, Dr. Lynn more than made good in his promise to uh, sing with uh, orchestras. 28 large-scale works were performed during his tenure with 14 orchestras, 16 conductors. Lynn made two major innovations that were really quite important. Having the conductors come on campus to rehearse with the symphonic choir before going to the on-site orchestra rehearsals. And for those rehearsals, he used student soloists and student accompanists. Now that allowed the accompanists and the students both to learn the valuable lesson of working with a renowned conductor. The choir also was able to become uh, familiar with the work as a whole as it was being sung. What an education it was for those of us in the student body. Some conductors were favored for others. <clears throat> Losing my voice, sorry. I think it's the air here or something. Anyhow, uh, Leonard Bernstein walked in campus, smiles on everybody's faces. He was just such a wonderful man to work with. We loved his vigor and the energy he brought. Eugene Ormandy was another favorite of ours because he was very thoughtful and very uh, introspective in his conducting. Um, I recall when we did the Requiem with Sherishan, we were perplexed because generally speaking, conductors raved about our preparation and tone. Uh, Herr Sherishan barely said a word. Even after the moving performance in Kennedy Center, or in the Avery Fisher Hall, we were somewhat perplexed at the non-response we got from the maestro. Three days later, a letter, a letter arrived at campus with Dr. Lynn immediately posted uh, on the Williamson Hall bulletin board. Mike Strothsherishman had written a glowing account of the concert and was extremely moved by the performances. Crowds of students lined up out the door, actually, to read this letter as if it were from an accounting firm <laughs> advising them that they have received an inheritance, <laughs> which, of course, we did. A fine experience with the noted conductor, <clears throat> singing magnificent masterpieces with outstanding solos and for a very solemn occasion. It's a little emotional for me right now, sorry. Um, we were very privileged, all of us. These experiences were exactly what Dr. Williamson had wanted when it came to the choral orchestral performances. Education under fire. Again, George Lynn's tutelage and faithfulness, the words of Dr. Williamson were proven. Singing for Dr. Lynn, as some of you know, was a demanding proposition. He expected and he got perfection. He also expected perfection from the faculty. Was he universally loved by them? No, probably not, but they all respected him very highly. While in Princeton, George missed his daily uh, ritual of composition, for George Lynn, composition was a religion unto itself. It was a huge part of his day-to-day -day routine. When at home, early mornings would find him in his robe and pajamas, sitting in a chair in the living room or in the studio with his lap board and a stubby pencil uh, creating or editing some new scores. Time for composition at Westminster was hard to grab as Dr. Lynn's energies needed to be elsewhere. He poured his every effort into Westminster and it was wearing him out. How sad we were to see him return to Colorado. However, that's where he needed to be. With Dr. Bristol leaving the school and the return to private life, and the new president taking over, Dr. Bernier, the longtime head of the organ department, had retired in 65. Perhaps Dr. Lynn left at that time, thinking it was the natural time to make a move. He never gave me a reason other than the lack of time for composition for making a move. He made a statement uh, when he left the choir college that reads, in my years at the college have been a privilege, sometimes very lonely, 
but always with the mission that the work of the founders must be kept at the core of its activity, lest the school suffer from the success of mediocrity. I need to remind any of us what standing and participating in the wings and sound had meant in our lives. Although Westminster is a college, it is perhaps better a school. We must never forget that. George Lynn departed Westminster, leaving it a finer place to be found, more musical, with a warmer choral palette. And as he left his beloved school, it moved past the mark of 250 performances with orchestras. The touring Westminster Choir was under the professional management of Columbia artists, singing concert halls throughout America. <clears throat> Dr. Lynn's legacy to Westminster was a talented and gifted faculty. And as he left his students, as did Dr. Williamson, with the ability to go out into the world and create beauty, to rouse sleeping voices, and to inspire countless people in the pews and concert halls of the world with their vibrant voices.